Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Matthew Van Beesen, I'm president of UMS, and I wanna welcome you to this really exciting kickoff event for UMS's 2020-21 Digital Artist Residencies. Um, we're thrilled to welcome uh, three of our digital artists, uh, residency artists here tonight. Uh, the fabulous American choreographer, Cleo Parker Robinson, uh, musician, performance artist, super creative, Tunde Olanarin, um, and of course, the incomparable Wendell Pierce. Um, we wanted to just say a quick word about why we're engaging in digital artist residencies this year at UMS. Of course, all of us in the performing arts have been affected in this moment. We've been hindered. Many people have just not been able to perform in any way, shape, or form during this moment. So we felt first and foremost that the digital artist residencies were a chance for UMS to keep investing in a substantial way in artists and artistry. Um, we thought it was a fabulous way to collaborate with them on new artistic projects, new thinking, exploring contemporary timely themes. Um, think about developing creative projects and moments uh, for our audiences and in this new digital frame. Um, but maybe even more interestingly, uh, we want a, you to have an, an audience to have a real glimpse and insight into the creative pro process, how projects are developed, how they're uh, conceived of, and what artists do to really move those uh, projects forward. So we're very, very excited about all the possibilities of digital artist residencies give UMS, our audiences, and of course, our spectacular artists. Um, to say uh, that this kind of project is a different one for UMS would absolutely be true. Um, we have really worked hard as a team to be creative in this moment, to be resourceful in this moment, but we would not be able to do it without some incredible supporters. And I just wanna take a moment to thank them. First and foremost, I wanna recognize UMS's sustaining directors. These are our board emeriti. Um, who have formed a group called the UMS Sustaining Directors, and they were really one of the first groups that heard about this project. It resonated with them, and they started stepping up immediately uh, to support. I'm so happy about the Sustaining Directors. So many of them have contributed to this. I want to thank their leadership, Tom Kinnear and Prue Rosenthal, uh, for their leadership and the Sustaining Directors. And then we have several major supporters, and I want to thank, first and foremost, our chair of the board, Tim Peterson. Tim and his wife, Sally, have stepped up in a major way to fund not only digital artist residency program, but specifically the work with Wendell Pierce this year. Uh, we just heard about a major commitment from the Community Foundation of Southeast Michigan. They will be supporting UMS's efforts in the digital space, including the digital artist residency program and our performance playground program. Um, and maybe the newest sponsor um, and someone that we're really proud to call not only a board member, but a great colleague and friend um, is Dean Alec Gallimore and the College of Engineering at the University of Michigan. And I'm really pleased to welcome the Dean here tonight. Alec, it's great to see you. Thank you so much. We, you know, we collaborated with you previously um, in some very, very special ways with the 2001 the Space Odyssey project back in 2018. And of course, last year's season opener was Snarky Puppy at Hill Auditorium. But Thank you for believing in UMS and what we do, and for always that spirit of collaboration that you bring. Thank you, Matthew, for your collaboration and friendship. It's always a delight to partner with you and UMS. One of the five sets of values of Michigan engineering is creativity, innovation, and daring, or CID for short. Digital arts can spark CID while illustrating engineering-related concepts, for example, by showcasing powerful visual and audio experiences, designing outputs over extended periods of time through various steps, and engaging stakeholders in the development process. Beyond the practical benefits of digital arts experiences, we believe all students and our entire community gain from the eye-opening and uplifting insights into humanity created by these arts. 
Michigan Engineering is proud to be a lead presenting sponsor of the digital arts residencies as a gift to our community. Personally, I appreciate how creative people such as Wendell Pierce will use this digital art environment to interpret the profound challenges we are facing as a society. Mr. Pierce's residency with a focus on social justice and anti-racism is especially timely. These digital artist residencies will present new opportunities for both artists and audiences. Matthew, or MVB as I like to call you, I commend you and your team for adapting to our circumstances with a CID spirit and approach. Thank you to the new and returning UMS sponsors for your openness to the possibilities. Enjoy this kickoff event and this series. Thank you. Alec, I want you to stick around for a couple of minutes. Um, what I've always appreciated about you as both a colleague and a friend um, is your willingness to think creatively in terms of partnerships, but also in the intersection of creative disciplines. And you know, all of us in the arts always feel confident about the way in which we think about creativity, but I love the way you think about it for scientists, for technologists, um, and all those disciplines. So we're gonna find a way uh, or ways uh, in this project with uh, Wendell Pierce, uh, which we're gonna talk about in just a few minutes, uh, to find a way to yet again, find that intersection of, of technology and creativity in the performing arts. So without further ado, I wanna welcome our uh, first guest tonight, uh, the amazing Wendell Pierce. Thank you, Wendell, for joining us. Wendell wins the award tonight for staying up the latest. Uh, <laughs> he's currently six hours ahead uh, in Rome, in Italy. And, uh, grazie, grazie mille. <laughs> Wendell's accent is getting better day by day. And uh, we, Wendell, we so appreciate uh, our viewers tonight, of course, um, many of whom are very, very familiar with your work in film and television. Um, you're a veteran of the stage as well. Um, we are just so thrilled to have you participate in this project, but the ways in which you've challenged us from the very beginning, I'd love to yes. kind of kick things off. First of all, I'm just thrilled that you're also connecting with Al Galmore tonight. Th yeah, absolutely. Thank you. You know, uh, it goes back in time that uh, the connection between an artist and a patron is a valued and a precious thing. So I do not take it for granted, uh, Dean Galmore that uh, you have supported this idea. And I just wanted to let you know also um, that I first understood my place in the world as an artist and understood the artistry, the combination of uh, technical proficiency and artistic creativity in trigonometry class. Mm -hmm. It was there that I understood that we had these theorems and technologies and all of these uh, formulas that are tools that we can use in our own unique ways, your proof will be different than mine, but there's an absolute and authentic, real answer and truth that we will get to. And you can get to it your particular way and I can get to it to my way. And that's when I understood that I had freedom within form to do that. So while I failed trigonometry class, <laughs> I did learn, I did learn that technology and creativity and being an expressive artist uh, we're one in the same, that science is art and art is science and that the two um, can go hand in hand. They're not in competition, they're in concert with each other. So thank you for supporting me. And this is a, you couldn't get a more uh, unique example where that merger of creativity and technology comes together. And this, uh, this digital residency is, uh, is very special, especially profoundly important in a time the difficult times that we find ourselves in. So it just goes to show you that your way of thinking is of profound importance. And I hope that uh, the work that we do demonstrates that. So thank you. And thank you to the board, the board chair and his wife, especially. Um, that patron artist relationship uh, is an age old important relationship that uh, we're continuing, continuing today uh, with UMS. Great, thank you so much. Um, so Wendell, I, I wanna talk to you a little bit in some ways, you know, you've been uh, at the at the forefront of this project from the very beginning. I think, yes. you know, in some ways you were the first artist we started talking to about this possibility. Talk to us a little bit about um, how you've envisioned your digital artist residency 
at UMS and you know, in your work as an artist right now during this moment? First of all, the most important thing that we have to remember is the role of an artist. We understand entertainment. We understand the residual of being an artist, but the role of an artist uh, serves for the community what thoughts are to the, to the individual. When you lie awake at night and reflect on who you are, who you hope to be, where you failed, where you have succeeded, what your uh, ambitions are, what your fears are, mm. um, what thoughts are to the individual. The role of the artist is for the community as a whole. It's in the forum of art and creativity where we collectively come together as a community and reflect on who we are, who we hope to be, our strengths, our weaknesses, our failures, our triumphs. Declare what our values are and then once those are declared to then go out into our communities and act on them. That is the role of art, where we reflect on what is of great importance to us as a community and find consensus and common ground. And it's with that I understand that I have a great responsibility as an artist. I am from New Orleans, so we were destroyed by Katrina 15 years ago. And it's in times of crisis where we as a community have to decide what our values are and how are we going to recoup those values and how are we gonna rebuild our lives? And there was a play to speak to that. And that was Waiting for Godot. I did it in the lower ninth ward. Two men in a void, not knowing what their existence was, what it is now and what the future holds for them. And it was on that spot where so many people lost their lives in the midst of the great disaster of Katrina where the lines rang out like a clarion call at this place, in this moment in time, all mankind is us. Let us do something while we have the chance. That line called out to me now in the midst of this pandemic in the same way, in the midst of this racial reckoning in the same way. We have the challenge. How are we going to do it? Live theater and live performance is stymied. We can't get together. And so that's when, Matthew, you and I started to have this discussion about this digital artistry of how I know during this pandemic and post-pandemic, we are going to have to have a hybrid of what we knew before, live performance, but at the same time, digitally, making sure that it's accessible to our audience in a virtual way. And that's the creativity that we're trying to do here. We also have the dilemma of just the logistics of doing the art. So we're gonna to come together in our own bubble, in our own quarantine and work together as artists to do a play that then speaks to the other pandemic of racial reckoning that we've come to. How even the micro and macro aggressions can not only have an impact on a community as a whole, a city and state and country as a whole, but it actually is insidious. Racism is insidious and attacks just the interpersonal relationships of family. And that's what you see in some old black man. Yeah. My dissertation has ended. I will stop now and accept no, your no, no. next well, question. I, I wanna talk about some old black man uh, in just a second, but one thing that's really kind of, not just impressed me, but inspired me um, in our conversations with you is how you've continued to push as an artist, to continue to explore where are there going to be possibilities? Where are there going to be these sort of seams to go down? Um, you did a project at the Billy for the Billy Holiday Theater in New York um, yes. called Angry Men and Women. Um, you did the wonderful Ta-Nehisi Coates project with HBO. How has this been for you as an artist to, to look for these opportunities that are both performative, but they're also logistical and in nature in terms of what's required? I knew when it happened, uh... I, I couldn't be stagnant, um, that when we first uh, were shut down with this pandemic, something told me this is going to be with us for a while. But, you know, I have a mantra in my family. It's, uh, you know, what are you going to do? You know, uh, don't ever say you can't do anything, can't die three days before the creation of the world. Don't ever tell me you can't do something. So I knew that we had to find a way to still perform as artists live. So there was a logistics uh, challenge that we had to meet. And with the Billie Holiday Theater, um, 
also they spoke to what was happening, the zeitgeist mm. that is happening now about our racial reckoning. In front of it is the first mural, the Black Lives Matter mural. And on that mural, we did a performance of the 12 angry men and women, monologues of police brutality, testaments of real stories of men and women who have been brutalized, embarrassed, traumatized in, um, in police uh, inter interactions uh, and how they can impact a person's life. And that performance was virtual, the logistics of it. It was a live stream that went out around the world. Uh, you can still see it today um, on, on the YouTube channel, the same way you're engaging with us now. That's the Billie Holiday Theater in Brooklyn, New York. Then there was an opportunity to do Tanahishi Coates's book before, uh, uh, Between the World and Me, uh, by Tanisi Coates, um, that was shot for HBO, also in a virtual way. Performances, the director was actually in New York. I went to Atlanta. We were connecting virtually, but still had the time to film something that I think is going to be impactful. And actually the material itself speaks to uh, that same sort of uh, injustice that the sort of insidious personal traumatic impact of, um, of, of, of racism. Uh, and what the fire next time was a generation ago by James Baldwin between the world and me was for our generation. And so I started to understand and see how you can do both. The two can coexist, that you have a technical way of still being a live performer and artist and at the same time do the material that you know will be impactful and important at the time. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to do as I build this new journey and new road um, of virtual digital artistry. And I'm so appreciative of UMS actually being on the vanguard of this. No other presenter is dealing with it the way that UMS is dealing with it. We're talking about musicians and actors and, uh, and, and performing artists and dancers and choreographers, all in this digital season of res residency here at UMS that nobody uh, can compare to. So I really want to thank you, Matthew, and all the sponsors for that. It's our pleasure. I mean, and, and you were really encouraging us, not, not just agreeing to, to, to projects, but in challenging us. I think I want to, uh, I want you to talk a little bit about some old black man as a work, but also, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was you, I think, who said to us, like, let's not just do this virtually on Zoom. Let's let's do it in this special way. Um, can you talk about that work briefly and, and how we're going to approach this? Uh, yes. Uh, some Old Black Man is a wonderful play written by the young playwright James Anthony Tyler. He's fantastic. Uh, he trained at Juilliard, where I was a student also, although years, uh, <laughs> decades before him. <laughs> And it's directed by <laughs> directed by Joe Kakachi, who is our director. And uh, I play a uh, a professor in Harlem on the first morning that I bring my my father home to my place of residence in Harlem, as I've moved him from Mississippi for the first time uh, to live with me, as he is eighty three years old, and um, uh, we are both alone and now we're going to live together. There's a history there that we have to uh, yeah. reconcile. That's all I'm going to say. I don't want to ruin it for you. Yeah. Uh, and it, de it deals with micro and macro aggressions uh, personally and uh, racially, and, uh, and I, uh, I don't want to ruin it. Yeah. So here's this wonderful play. So how do we do a play in this time of pandemic? And I realized most of the theaters now who have succeeded we're smart enough to have uh, a, a, a live stream and camera presentations and filming of their productions. You have the National Theater in London that had a, a, a huge um, archive of plays for 10 years. And during these past six months, they've been able to go to those archives and present them to the world. I know they were successful plays when they ran at the National Theater, but just in this pandemic, 16 million people saw those plays. Yeah, And so now we realize we cannot, from this point forward, look at 
our present presentations and not realize that it has to be a hybrid. We have to film while we perform live. I also think it was an ideal opportunity to make a public health case yeah. study, you know, great public health school there okay. at Michigan. Yeah. And we're going to be in, we're going to be in, uh, in quarantine as we rehearse the great Charlie Robinson is uh, the actor playing my father. And we will live together while we rehearse along with the playwright, along with the director, as we are in quarantine to protect ourselves with the logistics of the, of the pandemic. And then we will film in studio a live production of the play, still working out the possibility of doing quick tests with a small audience and therefore we then set a precedent for theater companies, for pre presenters around the world of how we can come back post pandemic and still be safe and still do our material out there. This is not a Zoom call reading. This is far beyond it. And then we will have the presentation and film that then as you as a presenter at UMS can go out and put it on networks around the world and show it then also, so it lives on besides the, the live moment that we will create with the play and go on. So I, that sort of, that is ingenuity when it comes to the presentation of the work. That is safety when it comes to the infrastructure of how we do it. That is innovation as we take technology and merge it with live performance and then have something that can go on and live past us. That's the thing that makes something classic that it speaks to people in the moment that we produce it and then the years to come long after we're gone. And I think that's what we have an opportunity here. And that is human. And I think documenting the artistry that takes place, the creativity that takes place, but also the, the moment and the conditions in which we will have done this together and, and created this collaboration, I think it's particularly sort of meaningful right now. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Not only in the logistics of dealing with the pandemic, but all this, also the subject matter of the time, uh, taking advantage of the time that we collectively can come together and improve our humanity yeah. by taking into account the, the reckoning and also understanding the humanity that just family, the importance of family, yeah. um, which, which this play is so much, uh, uh, so profoundly speaks to. Uh, nothing counts so much as family. And the thing that's important about family, no matter how dysfunctional we may become, it is, it is the best connection to your past. Yeah. And most likely the people who will be there for you in the future. And that's the thing that we're discovering in this time of pandemic, this time of uncertainty, of trying to find those things which are of great importance to us and magnify those because they will be the things that we'll be able to hold on to. In this case, it's family, it's humanity, it's challenging us and finding a way forward. And that's what we're doing with this project. It's an incredible project. You're, you're the first cab off the rank uh, yeah. on, this, uh, on this endeavor. And, and uh, Wendell Pierce, thank you so much for being here. We're gonna bring you back in a little bit. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Appreciate, uh, all, the, appreciate all the support and everybody who's uh, who's gonna be a part of this project and we're looking forward to presenting we're, we're it. We're really this. looking forward to this. So we're gonna see you in just a little bit. Wendell, thank you for staying up late. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Um, I wanna hand it over now to our next artist, uh, Tunde Olanarin. We first got to know uh, the great Tunde Olanarin uh, in our project in Flint in 2019 with Yo-Yo Ma. Um, he became our digital, our artist in residence, uh, research artist in residence last season. Uh, we developed a friendship and a collaboration with Tunde. Um, so it just made all the sense in the world to really tee him up in this context moving forward. And I'm excited that my uh, wonderful colleague, Mary Rader, is here to interview Tunde. Take it away, guys. Thank you, Matthew. Um, as uh, Matthew says, I'm Mary Rader. I'm part of the programming team at UMS, and it is my pleasure to welcome uh, the Flint-based artist and activist Tunde Olanarin um, to the conversation. So welcome, Tunde. Hey, Mary. Uh, hi. In my life, and not just when I'm at work on the clock, I'm a really big fan of Tunde's. I think I've been fangirling since at least 2014. 
Um, the performances oh, are sorry. consistently some of the most fun shows I've ever been to in my life. And I, as I was preparing for our conversation today, I was trying to remember the last time I actually saw you live. You're going down memory lane. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was probably last summer in a parking lot in Ann Arbor. <laughs> Your set got cut short because of a uh, pure Michigan thunderstorm. It was fun. That was fun. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, I'm really excited that in, in my work life, UMS gets to continue building on the work we've done with you that Matthew described in the introduction. Um, UMS is supporting the release of your new record, which is coming out in November of 2021. Um, and we're supporting it through the commissioning of a set of experimental participatory digital performance experiences that are tied to the release of four singles from that record. And I'm going to let you say more about what that means in a little bit. <laughs> okay. But first, I'm hoping that you can uh, tell us all a little bit about yourself, um, where you're from, and what kind of work you make. Sure. Um, so my name is Tunde Alaniran, um, he, him, they, and I'm based in Flint. I'm from Flint. I would say that I'm a pop music performance artist and have been really growing what my, I guess, art practice looks like and the disciplines within that. But yeah, I'm really at the core, just really excited to look at pop music at, and performance through a really trend aggressive lens and uh, just it's pop is a very challenging and like shifting format but I'm really into capturing the fun and the urgency within that while like not reinforcing the more oppressive elements that you find in commercial pop music and to encourage listeners and people who are watching to not be like passive or uncritical when they're enjoying that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. And then I think over time, I've grown more and more interested in supporting black queer artists on the femme end of the spectrum. I think especially in, in a place like Michigan, a state like Michigan, um, black femme artists generate a lot of culture historically but historically do not profit from or have access to all those resources that that art and culture generates. So that's been kind of an organic uh, progression of like my art and my art practice is like trying to continually like collaborate with and share, share work and share my work process and like open that up to other artists because you can it can be isolating, you know, in a, in a place like this. So just like recognizing that, you know. I think one of the things that I, I mean, I most enjoy about your performances and listening to your music. I mean, it's there are dance collaborators, there are choreographers you work with. Like the looks are all over the top and amazing. And you really, you you just mentioned some of your your collaborators, but you you've introduced me to other musicians that I have since gone on, you know to develop my own fan fandom of, I think of, you know, artists like Aya Simone. Um, and yeah. So, Aya. I, <laughs> so you're the, the, the attention that you're bringing to the artistic community um, in Southeastern Michigan and beyond is, is amazing. Um, as a recording artist in quote unquote normal times, there's a certain <laughs> order of operations that you undertake in the lead up to um, a record release. And I'm wondering if you can talk to us about what that process typically would be, how it's different in the age of COVID and how this is impacting your current record release um, and the ways you're thinking about sharing that work. Sure. I mean, I've, I've, I've never been a really traditional artist, but I would say, um, out, like me, let's say tw pre-2020, uh, there would be music you ha you've created, you've traveled to maybe different places to like get that music together. Um, you are able to, to be in different places to film music videos, right? Or film content. You plan a tour around the album release date and it's all in a pretty condensed format. Um, it's a pretty condensed timeline. And I think um, even before UMS, and I started talking about this digital residency, I'd had this opportunity to uh, help produce um, the opening ceremony of the Allied Media Conference, which is this amazing conference in Detroit. And I always talk about them because they're great. But it 
it really helped me to reflect on what my priorities sh like should be as an artist right now. And I'm also like obsessed with the Nat Ministry. I don't know if people follow like that, uh, Trisha Hersey's work where trying to like separate myself from this intense urgency around everything and an urgency to be productive within a really condensed timeline and how uh, actually like the racist roots of that kind of like mindset are. Um, so really trying to like decolonize my own mind about being productive. Um, so I thought, well, what if this, what if this took time to build out more slowly? What if we were able to acknowledge, you know, now, A, there are a lot of more virtual elements of how people are coming together and people, it's harder to even collaborate on the front end on things in person. So understanding like what that can feels like and how that's different. And then like, I know you and a lot of other people who are watching this have been in 511 live streams. You've been in so many live events. You've been just staring at boxes, <laughs> uh, glowing boxes, glowing rectangles everywhere. So how do I, and how do artists, how do we show up in this moment and reflect a current time and still have an emotional experience in these rectangles, you know? Like how do we still capture the emotionality um, that exist and like acknowledging that I'm not a representative for every social movement that's happening right now and like every movement that came before or after me, but I'm a human in this time. And how do we acknowledge the emotions that like we are feeling right now? But I also would say like social like movements and 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 those things all grow within art and culture and art and culture fuel those movements. And the growing of art and culture is cumulative. It's not, you know, something's happening. Let's make a song about it. Here's a song about this thing that's happening. There's music from decades and generations before that have like helped people develop a consciousness up until this point. So also knowing as an artist, like it's okay to just be an artist in this time because you're gen you're you're contributing to culture and art for people to like draw power and perspective from. Um, so that's like a very out there like kind of explanation but when it comes to this residency um we're looking at each song and creating some experience that for me is going to be like very uh able to be enjoyed virtually but still capture and transfer like some form of emotion if that makes sense. And some sense of like, some sense of that urgency and vitality that like pop music for me has always kind of embodied. Well, I think we are, we're looking forward to the first single release in November. So yeah. we won't spoil kind of what the experience is for you, but keep an eye out for that. And we'll be asking, we'll be inviting some folks to really help participate and like creating, you know, how that looks visually and um, how we engage with that, like on social media, so. Looking forward to it, really excited. Um, so UMS, the organization, became officially acquainted with you during the Flint Day of Action with Yo-Yo Ma last year, February 2019. And your relationship with Yo-Yo has since grown into a musical one. Um, I understand there was a collaboration that you all had together that might premiere next year. I'm wondering if there's anything you can tell us about that, um, the composition, the recording yeah. process. Um, how it all came to be. I'm really excited about that. So Yo-Yo is just this, is this iconic, you know, artist. And um, he, I think he was really interested in doing something new. And they reached out while I was on tour and we actually got in the studio to work on something. But I was like, I want to talk to him. So we, we really talked and Yo-Yo helped kind of write the song with me that is about his place in the world as an artist and where he is in his life and career. And I think a lot of people in his in his age are like considering what is my legacy? How do I how do I make the world better for for people after me? So I just feel like it's such a new thing and new perspective from Yo-Yo that I'm very excited for people to hear. And it also was such a fun song to write with him so like it really took my, my i played it for my mom and she like cried she's like obsessed with yo-yo ma and i am now too <laughs> so 
hopefully um, we're able to share that with folks next year. Like I'm really looking forward to that. That's amazing too. More to be excited about. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for spending time with me this evening. We're, we are like Wendell are going to bring you back for a larger group conversation. At the I'm right end. here. I'll stay right, right so, here. Yeah. Okay, bye to you for now. And I'm going to pass the baton to the UMS VP of Education and Community Engagement, Kyan Harris. Hello. Thanks, Mary. And uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce and welcome Cleo Parker Robinson. Cleo is the founder, artistic director, and choreographer of Cleo Parker Robinson Dance, which is celebrating its 50th year. Welcome. I mean, good to be here. And how fascinating to hear our other artists. My God, how wonderful. What an honor and a privilege. It, it's, it's amazing. These, these conversations are so exciting, aren't they? Oh, I'm rejuvenated. I, I mean, <laughs> Wonderful, Tunde and Wendell. I mean, I, I, I mean, I feel like I know them now that it's virtual. I feel like we're really, really connected now, and it's amazing. I never believed in the virtual stuff as as much as I do now. And thank you for the opportunity. It's wonderful. We're so glad to have you, Cleo. Um, you are you're coming to us from Denver, which is your home base, and I wondered if you'd just start by telling us a little bit about. Why Denver? Uh, so many dance companies are based on the coasts, LA, uh, yeah. New York, um, and, and you are based in Denver. So tell us about how that came about and, and what it means to work in Denver. Well, you know, um, lots of people ask when I came to Denver, but I was actually born in Denver in Five Points in a historic, amazing place where jazz was really, really vital at that particular time. But during the Jim Crow laws, it was really an extraordinary time. My father being black, my mother white, in a very, um, I mean, really Denver was the West. I mean, people didn't look at it like they did um, New York or, or, or LA. And I, you know, I was dying to get to New York and LA and I did early. I mean, I got to LA at 16 and New York at 19 and fell in love with both coasts. But I knew that we were in the middle of the country. And uh, the opportunity to bring what what inspired me uh, to others, because I knew that they would never necessarily have the experience of um, what I did growing up. But now at the Rossonia, where it was the first black hotel that was ever created at, during the segregation. So there, I mean, black jazz musicians came in, Billy Holiday, I hear the Billy Holiday Theater, and I was like, oh yeah, and I saw Billy Holiday. And and, uh, and when you think about um, all of the great artists that came through, I mean, I was a child, I was a baby, but it's a blood memory. And so it's in my, it's in my soul, it's in my spirit. And so because I felt like I was in the world, you know, you got Duke Ellington and Count Basie and everything, you know, um, I, Billy Holiday, Bess, you know, Bessie Smith, you got them all in there. And my daddy and my mother are talking about them all the time. And I'm, it, it's, it's there. So, you know, so I was born in Denver. Uh, and then, of course, when I did get to New York, my teacher who was with the Met, um, she was uh, Rita Berger uh, at Colorado Women's College, just said, you know, you need to be um, in New York at, and, and decide where you want to be. And I was really leaning against, uh, I had a dance studio, but I was leaning, I, I mean, really, um, you know, be, our, our culture was saying, you know, if you're going to be somebody, you better be a doctor, you know, be a lawyer, but, you know, that kind of thing. My father was the first black actor in Denver. Wow. And so I grew up in that extraordinary continuation of being in the theater. And um, it was really something. Uh, because we could create our own world. I said, you know, I'm going to create my own world. And that's the way we did it. We, You know, I felt like I wanted to be in the world, so I felt like I brought the world to Denver and Denver to the world. And for me, um, I had everybody in the world who was near me to help me create that. And so it, it's really a blessing. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, that origin story. Beautiful. Um, what I want to ask you next, Cleo, is um, you are an incredibly accomplished choreographer, but you've also chosen to uh, mentor and guide and create opportunities for young dance makers uh, throughout your career. 
And I'm just curious about how, how you decided that that would be one of the things that, that you really focused on through your company. You know, I don't know that anything was my, my intention. I believe that, um, I mean, I think it was the times that I was in. I was during the Black theater movement. Black theater movement was very much influencing everything, art, the, I mean, Renaissance period in Harlem. We were all influenced by each other. And so I was influenced by Alvin Ailey and Arthur Mitchell. So when I went to New York, that's where I was going to be, live and stay. And when I realized that we didn't have that in Denver, we did not, then I, I shifted my, my desire. And I think my desire to be a dancer and choreographer uh, and be on Broadway or the court, you know, whatever that was, it shifted to my community. I became very, very, um, I don't want anyone to experience what I did, which was, why did I not have access? Why did I not know? Why did I, what, I, that plagued me. And so I think that was even greater than my needing to um, have only my, my journey. So I just felt very much like I'm in the journey, but you're going to be with me. And so, um, you know, as I began to choreograph, I brought in choreographers. And the more choreographers I brought in, the fewer there were women. They, they weren't. They were mostly men. Mm. And, I, and that's the way it was. Um, so I became really quite rare, especially especially in my region. Um, and only did I hear about Catherine Dunham or, or Pearl Primus, and I realized that they were um, they were anthropologists. And so I knew that kind of I mean I wasn't interested in just being the performing artist, but I was interested in culture and how we see the world. And so that shaped a lot of times. You know, I was introduced to, of course, the great Donald McHale. And um, I mean, I, these people came, I, I heard about Harry Belafonte, Sidney Poitier, um, Sammy Davis Jr. Those, those are the people we talked about every day. So when I got to really meet them, I really felt like I knew them and I was already in their world. So I was already in the rhythm. And so when I was in Denver, I was not in the rhythm. I was sort of, <laughs> Denver was a little off rhythm. I was like, okay, how do I, if I'm gonna live here, how do we create a rhythm that we can have harmony and really create something extraordinary together? So I think we were all committed. Everybody wants, I mean, we were attracting uh, the kinds of things that we knew we needed to feed our own souls and mm -hmm. to tell our own stories. So um, the focus of your residency with UMS is gonna mm -hmm. revolve around a really incredible work uh, called The Four Journeys. You wanna tell us a little bit about The Four Journeys? First of all, I just have to thank you. This is, you know, I think Wendell spoke it and Tunde, just how unusual, how extraordinary this relationship is. Um, and for us to um, have the support and the vision that UMS has about us creating this work. I think when we started working on the four journeys, uh, it was before the pandemic and everything halted. I mean, we were working in Oklahoma City creating the work there. We had a, a bit of a residency to start working. And I had been working with Viviana uh, Basanta, who is just extraordinary, a choreographer and the director of her mother's company, Ballet Folklorico de Mexico, and she's just phenomenal. So she had done a work um, before on us, but she really wanted to do a work talking about the African roots of Mexico and how how when we think about Mexico, we really don't have, it's almost from an anthropological point of view, you know, what is Mexico? What are the influences? And so it really is all of the, the different intersections of the world from Africa to from Spain, Asia, Europe. It is all of that and the indigenous influence there. And so um, I hadn't been in Mexico City in a long time, but then coming uh, reading about what uh, Viviana's mother had done, I realized that the Catherine Dunham had helped create that company. So, wow, I just felt like that wow. was our section right then. Um, it was just fabulous. I mean, it's like Mexico was where we needed to be. So we began to really work together. Uh, but when the pandemic hit, we had just come out of um, Oklahoma City starting it, and Viviana couldn't be with us. 
She had just had hip surgery and she wasn't quite healed yet. So we worked with two of her protégés um, and we worked with her virtually. So we started working virtually with her. And I'm thinking, well, when are we actually going to work with her? And she would, every day we'd get our notes. We'd have five or six hours on, uh, on virtually. And I'm like, I don't, I don't work virtually. Well, little did I know <laughs> we'd be working virtually. And when we got back and the pandemic hit and we were entering our 50th anniversary, all I could think of is how are we going to premiere this work? How are we, how are we going to, this is what we've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. um, so I think with your mask saying, if it's not ready, if you, I mean, if there's stages that you're in, let us support you. And I'm thinking, what? I'm like, <laughs> what? How, how blessed is that? So, so now beginning to take in the making of the four journeys. Mm -hmm. Give us some more time as well. Time for us to dig deeper, dig deeper, because I think um, there's so much to, to it, so much. And for us to document, which we will now begin to do, is document the first process, which we start next week. Starting. Amazing. Yes. Is that fabulous? It is fabulous. I'm so excited. I can't wait to see the four journeys when it finally comes to the stage. Um, every way you've described it has been inspiring to me. And I think this making of video that will come about as a part of the residency will really offer audiences insights into actually parts of the process that typically they don't see. Well, and our, our actually the animation artist he is in, he's from Japan and he's in Singapore. He can't get back to Japan. So, you know, we were still trying to figure out how do we get him here from Singapore? And we're looking at images that are coming now and they're just magnificent. And um, so, so now the, the designer, the young costumer who, co who actually her mother costumed for Amalia Hernandez. So here we have the second generation in Mexico working with our, Anima, animation artist in, in uh, Singapore, and we're in Denver creating the movement and carrying on online. It's really, it's the world is moving. That's the way I like it. Amazing. <laughs> so Cleo, um, we could talk all night, but actually I think it's time to um, bring back Tunde and Wendell, if they're ready. Ooh. Hi. Wait. <laughs> Hi. Oh, hey. they, are, they just Hello. Blew my <laughs> um, Wendell, so, I need a transcript of everything you said because it was just like so. <laughs> like that's really the thing. That's the thing. I just wanted to say. I'm sitting here listening, and I'm sitting. I, I, I can't wait to 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 watch. You know, I, I, I'm sitting here as as a, a as an audience member. I can't wait to see the projects. Can you imagine if we had the video of the making of Revelations with Alvin Ailey? company and we're going to have footage of Cleo Parker Robinson creating four journeys that that is the new way that is the new yes. way this is thrilling i can't wait to hear Tunde's new work i need that and talk about your mom. i mean just by the way yo yo mine i did whatever i'm thinking <laughs> <laughs> That's just phenomenal. And Wendell, I've seen you many times, you know, and I got introduced to your music yesterday, today, and I'm like, mm -hmm. now they are outrageous. And I like that. I like that. I you like don't it. understand. I'm obsessed with you. Like, seriously, I, I, I'll just leave it at that. I won't. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Wake uh, up this world. So, uh, I mean, waiting for Godot. My father did um, maybe oh. 50 years ago. Wow. And uh, as one of the first black actors, I remember my boyfriend, who's my husband of 50 years now. Now, now you know, he's the same. Let, let me tell you. When we <laughs> saw that, this, he said, did you get it afterwards? He said, I don't know what we're waiting for. And that's where I feel, you know, you were speaking about that work, how poignant it is right now. Yeah, and I it can't is. see your work. Um, I, I, I mean, I can't wait to see it. So can we see it on, can we see the process? You know, that's uh, what we, I- We will, you will see, uh, with some old black man, you will see, uh, uh, you won't see the process because we're going to be, we're going to be in um, quarantine as we rehearse, but you will, 
you will see, I guess there's a part of it that you will be able to see a part of the process as we go into that technical aspect of it. And then ultimately the final production, which would be great. I, I just, this just reiterates the glad. importance of artists in a time like this. Mm -hmm. Just the conversation you're hearing between us at this time and understanding how inspired we are by each other which will then speak to the audience uh, and the wonderful uh, subscription audience that you have. And then it will last beyond our performances for millions to see afterwards. And I think mm -hmm. that's important. Mm. Um, if you don't mind me interrupting just briefly, I wanted to let our audience know that if anyone has a question out there, um, send it through in the comments and we can, we can take a few questions. Um, but also, and you all have touched on this, um, I think that you've all actually spoken to it uh, in, uh, without us coordinating, but um, I'd be interested to hear from you about the role of the artist right now. Um, you know, I, Wendell, you actually spoke directly to it. Um, Cleo, you've talked a little bit about um, what it's meant to be an artist over time and all the influences that come before you that kind of help propel you forward. Um, but I think just hearing from each of you a little bit on um, what it means to be an artist right now and, and what actions you feel like you, you want to take or you need to take. Well, Wendell, I could listen to you for days. So, you know, <laughs> I, I was taking notes. Now, I'm going to tell you that. That was what <laughs> You know, I, 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 truly, I mean, I, I can talk about what it means, but I, I'd love but to hear from you. Oh, it's really it really speaks to what you were saying, Cleo. Um, first of all, we're as artists, we find ourselves in this moment and in this time um, being challenged uh, and knowing that we have to speak to the moment as artists. Mm -hmm. uh, whether we're clear about what how we're going to do that or not, we feel it being induced in us because it's a natural thing that artists speak to our collective consciousness, you know, our collective humanity, where people, even unbeknownst to them, are saying, speak to me, give me clarity or some semblance of understanding of what we're going through. It is, it goes back to the first moments as we sat around the fire and someone stood up to tell the story about mm -hmm. happen, what happened to the day so they can mm -hmm. understand all the trials and tribulations that they went through. The, in that particular day, give me purpose, give me meaning for it. And I think that's what artists see today. We are like a Joshua generation who have been handed this responsibility from a Moses generation. Mm -hmm. Me, particularly as an actor, I think of Harry Belafonte, as uh, Ms. Robinson was talking about, and Sidney Poitier, who were, who were um, stars of their mm -hmm. day. But little, but they were activists also. They flew down in a private plane to give money mm -hmm. to the students as they were trying to get people to register in Mississippi, in Philadelphia, Mississippi, on the same road where Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner were murdered. I think about e even someone like Charlton Heston, who I didn't even have. Ultimately, we th there was a separation when it came to politics, but even Charlton Heston was at the March on Washington. And mm -hmm. as, a, as a young kid who wants to be an actor, I remember that. Mm -hmm. I remember that you have historical significance. And not only when they are active politically or active in an activist or advocacy way, but also with their art. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a poet uh, who moved people to solidarity and then ultimately became the president of Poland. You know, uh, even someone who, um, um, I'll never forget when we lost New Orleans, sorry to indulge on that, but whenever I heard Louis Armstrong, when Pop said, do you know what it means to mm. miss New Orleans and to mm -hmm. each night and day? Mm -hmm. Our hearts were broken. You mm. heard that. And mm. even if he didn't sing, just the... Mm. Just the, the, to to hear to hear Aaron Copeland to this day, I cannot hear Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring and not be moved because mm. I understand that that is a vision of hope 
and struggle and uh, self-determination that is embodied in a composition of music that will speak to a soul of anyone from any walk of life, from any part of the world at any point in time on this earth. Long after we're gone, people will hear Appalachian Spring. Love it. And That's it. it touches you, right? Well, no, we didn't At the know same you were... way, as the same way as you can hear. Like... <laughs> uh, 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 Wendell, what was going on in the I'm going on and on and on. Wendell, you're going to be singing with Tunde here in a minute, and I'm going to be dancing because I saw the dance. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know, I but that that's the role of an artist. And we will speak to our time and in this moment uh, with that sort of uh, exactness it's, it's and uh, powerful, that impact, yeah, that impact. Powerful time and the artist has the extraordinary role and responsibility. I think what I just want to share real quickly is that I created a piece right before the pandemic called The Movement. And um, I had been working in Alabama with one of my dancers who now was was directing the, the dance department there, Michael Metcalf. And he said, Cleo, you know, come on in and, and celebrate the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination. So being there in Alabama and just connecting with all that, and I had gone to Dr. King's home and I saw Harry Belafonte's picture. I couldn't get in. I had about five minutes between rehearsal and get back to the theater and I ran over there. And I'm peeking in the window like, let me in, I only have break time. But anyway, as I looked at Harry's picture, I, I went, oh my God, Harry Belafonte is in my life. And he was really in my life. I've been working with Julie Belafonte for maybe 30 years now. And Harry and, uh, came and did a beautiful piece called The Healing Power of Art for us um, when I was doing some of the work. But anyway, um, just Harry, just making sure that you stand up for what you believe, stand up, stand, mm -hmm. stand for it. I think people need to realize that we're all in the movement. Now, we can choose what part of the movement, but to say, Absolutely. where am I in the movement? And that's what I said to those ballerinas. They were in their point shoes, and I had an opportunity to choreograph on them. And I walked in on the first day, and I said, I don't know what music I'm going to use. I don't know what dance step we're going to do. But I do know we're going to be talking about the civil rights movement because I'm that old. If I'm in my 70s, I'm coming to you. You all are in this country. You have to know how we got here. So I want your perspective of what you think is our freedom. Where's our freedom? And now let's dance about it. Tomorrow I'll find the music. I don't know what it is, but mm -hmm. a read came to me. And I remember the artist that stood on the front line, just like Harry Belafonte. He stood on the front line. And I said, we've always been on the front line, but we have to speak it now that we won't be the only ones on the front line, but everybody has to join us because there's so much change that we know we have the opportunity to make right now because there's a consciousness. There's something really quite powerful, painful and powerful. We can, we can make change right now. Thank you. Thank you, Cleo. And we do actually have a couple of questions from the audience that if I can break in, and actually I'm going to pose one of them to you, Tunde, because we haven't had a chance to hear from you quite yet. Um, at least I didn't, you didn't have a chance to respond to, uh, to my prompt. But um, one thing we heard was um, this audience member would love to hear what artists or artwork has been getting you through the pandemic. So, and, and if you've been influenced by other others at this time, but what's getting you through? Who are you turning to right now? That is such a funny question because I was going to ask that question of, um, <laughs> <laughs> I was actually gonna ask that question. Well, I'll say that um, Beverly Glenn Copeland uh, is a, a trans elder who is an electron, electric, electronic music pioneer in his seventies, released an amazing album called Transmissions this week and um is the most like rejuvenating sound for me and like just the message and the music and even the chord progressions he's choosing and the way he's using his voice is like i've been through something and i'm here to, to kind of help walk you through this thing you're in right now and like don't give up it's just beautiful so i any everyone please go listen to that record um and i'm going to just really quickly say for the uh, last thing the last question it's like 
you can go all the way from Paul Robeson. That's you know, you can go from Southern trees bear strange fruit, blood on the mm. leaves and blood on the roof. You can go all the way to Janiqua Charles. You were about to lose your job. You were about to lose your job. That meme, right? <laughs> right. So like all these things right. like kind of come together to help us make sense of what we're doing. And we can pull from, and I think the amazing thing about right now is that there's so many more voices that we have that we have access to that would have been completely invisible 30, mm. 40 years ago. And it really strengthens your sense of like purpose and hope. Like you're really not alone in how you how you're like, this is not okay. And I'm I'm not crazy for thinking this isn't okay, you know. So I think that's really powerful. Um, but I really wanted to ask uh, Wendell and Cleo, like, has there been any? Because music is so important to me and like regulates my moods. Has there been any music recently that you've heard that like reawakened you or or shocked you or gave you a sense of joy or anything that like or or new to you, even if it isn't new now, like something that you've discovered? You know, that, that's that's a really good question. Um, I have a problem hearing new music because uh. <laughs> I've reached that age where it's like, you know, I used to, you know, your new album came out on Tuesday. You went to the record store, you got it. And, like, and you know, and then you turn on the radio, you hear stuff. And I'm like, guys are like, man, did you hear that? I'm like, no, I still don't understand how my streaming service works. You know? Uh, you know? <laughs> but, so uh, there's, New folks, I haven't, but um, mm. I have. Uh, I have been on this whole thing of the connection of past, mm. uh, of classicism. You know, something mm. that mm. is connects mm. us through time and place, right? Mm. Uh, and and I've been listening to the connection between Claude Debussy, mm. right, French composer of the nineteenth century, maybe eighteenth, nineteenth century, yes. Um, and you listen to his work and then listening to Duke Ellington's mm. uh, Petal of a Rose. Mm. And, and just going back and forth between those two. Mm. Uh, have just, and I realize it's, it's, mm. it's you know, a hundred years later, that spirit and soul connected mm -hmm. them. And you, mm. hear, you, you just hear the connection in those two. They also are the most calming some mm. of the most calming music and that's the thing i am i have been crazed mm. you know i've been so you have this french this mm. frenchman yeah. in the 19th century and uh this just graceful elegant musical genius of washington dc in the mid 20th century mm. who played sat down and played the piano and they both heard in their head the same thing so mm. they they, they have been my inspiration while this has been going on. And Cleo. You know, that's so beautiful. Well, Duke Ellington for me, you know, I have a lot of stories about Duke Ellington um, because I work with Donald McHale ah. and, um, you know, for years I have, um, I mean, he passed a couple of years ago and I, I'm doing his last two works uh, and he created them in a wheelchair and what, I mean, he sang every day and night. And when he worked at the Denver Center, uh, Wendell, he reminds me of how we were quarantined. I mean, because we had to work. So mm -hmm. we would get these, these little, you know, these bed and breakfasts and we'd stay in those. we just work until we got the work done. And um, it, it, even though you think you're quarantined, it's really extraordinary because that's the way you get to really know somebody deeper. That's the way I work with Maya Angelou. But I think the thing for me, musically, musically, I mean, he was singing every second. I mean, we'd be going through some real changes and he'd come up with something. I'd say, we're going to sing through this. So that's mm -hmm. what I realized with the, with, with, with the, even the civil rights movement, um, hearing, um, I mean, understanding how we got through it. I had ballerinas singing and I said, I know you can't sing. And I remember, I said, we're going to sing, um, oh, I ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around. Turn, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. And then they, then the, what would happen is the ballet master would say, they can't sing, it's not in their contract. I said, they're not singing, they're chanting. And we're doing this, <laughs> you know, I mean, we have to, 
I had to find the soul of the work. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't find it just in the movement. It had to come in the in the voice. And uh, it, it was really an extraordinary moment. They changed the rule right there for that work. And they had never done that. But I think it's, um, oh, I know it's, it's um, I, I did a piece in the 70s, Creation Destruction with the Alice Coltrane. Mm. It was, oh, yeah. Yeah, oh. man, that's, um, that suits my soul and Love Supreme and Feral Sanders, oh, yeah. you know I mean? Mm. Wow. That's yeah. where, I mean, my soul has to be. I saw Pharaoh Sanders on my birthday, man. I'll never forget that. And, and Tunde, one other thing. Someone told me the other day, they said, oh, you're not into rap. I said, yeah, I'm into rap. I said, uh, I just, I just, I can't remember it. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 I just wait. can't remember it. We need but man, okay. there's we somebody, I swear, uh, Guru, mm. Guru. Mm-hmm. Guru was, uh, he was, serious. he was great. Guru. Okay. He, he passed away. And three of us, three mm. of us were these kids in Brooklyn who rapped. They took jazz solos mm. and spit rhymes on the jazz solos. Mm. So mm. And talk about that connection through mm. period mm. and time. I do they know took Guru. their yes, genre. Know and put, yep. Yeah. Guru, you know, I keep forgetting mm. the name of the group he was in. He passed away, but he was he, he was great. And then all the three of us, man, they did. Wow. They took. They took uh, bebop solos and mm. spit and spit rhymes to it. Uh, mm-hmm. That to me, that was like real innovative, man. Mm-hmm. Real innovative. Mm-hmm. Mary said, Gangstar. Gangstar. Yeah, somebody remember Gangstar. Wait, wait. So yeah. we were talking yeah. earlier. We have to do a uh, resident playlist. We were talking about this, but I feel like we need to do an inspirational playlist from like all the residents can collaborate on. Or, and I'm, I'll take the responsibility of bringing it together, but like, I love yes. hearing what stimulates all of your minds and your kitchen. So we're gonna, we gotta do that for sure. That yeah. that would be fabulous. I know everyone in the audience would love it. I would personally love it. Um, I have, I'm the bearer of bad news that we are out of time. Uh, I think Matthew's gonna come back and join us for uh, a final goodbye, but my goodness, this has been a treat to spend time with all of you tonight. And I'm, I just feel honored and excited and thrilled. Thank you, Kaya. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm-hmm. Honey, wonderful. What a treat. I, I feel like I'm right in Rome with you, Annie, and then up in, in Flint. Where are you? Now? Wait, I'm in Flint. Today, yeah, from Flint to Rome. All right. Flint to Rome. I got people Look, in that Jackson. Quite a journey. I got people in Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. Thank you all. I mean, what an amazing introduction for our audiences to the three of you. I, I you know, I think. All of us have just had a smile on our face this past hour, hearing uh, hearing about you and who you are, hearing about your artistry, hearing about what you believe in, and then this chance to see you intersect and play off one another. I think, I mean, it's just mm-hmm. joyous. Thank you so much. So Cleo Parker Robinson, Tundi Olanaran, Wendell Pierce, thank you so much. Thank you for being a part of UMS. Um, mm-hmm. In thank this you. future that we're forging for ourselves, but thank you for um, your artistry, but most importantly, who you are as human beings. We really we appreciate that. We value that. We can't wait to look to see what we're going to build together with you. So thank, thank you so you much. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you and I'm looking forward to tomorrow night, part two. That's right. Uh, yeah, okay. Wendell, okay. thank you for that prompt. I want to remind Wendell's all, everyone watching tonight. <laughs> Everyone watching tonight, tomorrow at 12 noon, uh, we have part two uh, with uh, the amazing performing, performing artist uh, Brian LaBelle and Allison Devonish, uh, a fabulous jazz uh, Lebanese Arabic pianist Tarek Yamani um, and his collaborators, the Spectral Quartet from Chicago, um, and then also Joyce DiDonato, uh, the marvelous mezzo-soprano uh, and friend to UMS. That's happening at 12 noon tomorrow. Michael Conjolka, Mark Jacobson from our programming team will be a part of that. Kyan, I think you're part of that as well. Or if I got that. No, I'm, I'm just on tonight. So yeah, this, uh, we'll see, this but, is it. Uh, I want to thank Kyan. I want to thank uh, Mary Rader. Um, and you don't see them tonight, but Sarah Billman, uh, Eric Woodhams, who produced this program tonight, I want to thank them. They've done a fabulous job with these StreamYard uh, pr- presentations. Um, thank you again to our artists. Thank you to our supporters, Tim and Sally Peterson, Michigan Engineering, Community Foundation of Southeast Michigan, the UMS Sustained Directors, 
We have help from Mellon Foundation. We have help from great friends like Joe and Caitlin Malcoon. Um, we just have a, an outpouring of support for these digital artist residencies, and we couldn't be more excited about the work ahead. So thanks to all of you. Thanks to everyone out there watching tonight. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow at noon Eastern time. Uh, Cleo, Tunde, Wendell, thank you again. Cayenne, fabulous job. Thank you. Have a out for I mean it's Rome. It's you know one I know go out. <laughs> no, I'll stay in. Okay. Yeah. Get some sleep. Yeah. Take care. Bye, Bye. 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 Stay connected. Thank you.